welcome and thank you everyone for joining us at the Cambridge Pro Bono Project Annual Lecture 2023. My name is Aradhi Sethya, I'm a PhD candidate and uh, one of the executive directors of the project. Uh, the Pro Bono Project was established in 2010 within the faculty of law. It was inaugurated by Professor Philip Kant Sands JC. Since then, the project has assisted various institutions, international courts, national organizations, and NGOs, charities, barristers or chambers for various public interest matters. In addition to research work, we also host an annual lecture every year. In, in past, these lectures have been delivered by Lord Justice Rabin the Singh, Baron S. B. Ben Kidron, Jeffrey Jagal QC, Timothy O. T. Q. C. Uh, Casey, among others. We take some time to get used to this. <laughs> now, it is not very often that we can truly say, and we mean it, that the speaker needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, and I think we all will agree that that's definitely true about Justice Chandra Chu. Nonetheless, I will try to introduce him as much as possible. Justice Chandra Chu studied economics and law at the University of Delhi. He then went on to pursue LLM and SGT at the other Cambridge, Harvard Law School, <laughs> <laughs> as an Intellect Scholar. In 1998, he was designated as a Senior Advocate and Additional Solicitor General, and was then appointed as the Judge of the Bombay High Court and Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court. After his elevation to the Supreme Court in 2016, he was appointed as the Chief Justice of India last year, position he is currently serving. Now, if all that was not enough, in his early 20s, he was moonlighted his, his radio job in all India. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely got to be my favorite. <laughs> now, his contribution to constitutional jurisprudence is extremely broad in India. It may require a PhD thesis of its own, and I assume the PhD candidates here would at least agree that for now one is enough for me. <laughs> I did not attempt uh, to... Uh, to describe all the cases. Now, the title of today's lecture is The Relationship Between Constitutional Rights and Constitutional Structure. The promise of constitutional rights, which I'm sure, uh, which I'm sure drives many of us to law, is not realized by my words on the paper. Uh, the, trans uh, the bringing the rights from parchment to practice requires, so to speak, institutional batteries. Constitution creates, organizes, divides powers. And that is essential to realizing constitutional rights. Now, what is the relationship between this constitutional arrangement of power and constitutional rights? I'm sure we have not gathered here to know my views. Uh, and for that, I invite Justice Randachud um, to address us on this. Thank you. Thank you. Very good afternoon. I'm really deeply honored to be invited to deliver the 2023 annual lecture uh, organized by the Cambridge Pro Bono Project. I'd like to thank Arad Desetria for this painstaking effort in organizing the lecture. Arad interned at my chambers nearly five years ago when he was a young student of law. And I remember working on uh, a very important aspect of our constitutional jurisprudence with him, which was explaining the silences of the Constitution. I'm happy to collaborate with Aradhya again today, though in a professional capacity. I'd like to begin the lecture this afternoon in my brief presentation by recalling what Homer has to say in his epic poem, The Odyssey. Ulysses, the protagonist, upon his return from the Trojan War, encounters sirens for beautiful creatures of the sea. Their mesmerizing voice has the capability of bewitching sailors and luring them to death. Ulysses, who is aware of this, asks his men to tie him up to the mast of the boat so that he does not succumb to the dangerous charm of the sirens. When Ulysses asked to be tied, he did so not to be deprived of his freedom, but rather to gain freedom and to overcome the temptation. 
But what if the rope which binds Ulysses realizes its power to impose restraint and exerts too much pressure, choking Ulysses in the process? Should the rope not have a restraint on the power that it exerts? In this metaphysical story, Ulysses represents a citizen and the rope represents the state. In the course of my presentation this afternoon, I will try and discern the relationship between the state and the citizens by referring to the relationship between constitutional structure and constitutional rights. I'll do so by focusing upon four key aspects of this relationship. First, constitutional processes. Second, institutional arrangements for governance. Third, the scrutiny of actions as envisaged by and implicit in our constitutions. And fourth, the participation of citizenry in a democracy. Now, similar to Ulysses, citizens across the world handed over a few rights to create a state. In doing so, they diminished their right to be free citizens, untrammeled by external forces. In exchange, the state is reposed with the duty to protect the life, liberty and property of citizens. In today's world, this agreement between citizens and the state is entrenched in the form of a modern constitution or a not so modern constitution. However, constitutions do not merely recognize the rights that citizens hold but they also ascribe the rights that they ought to hold in modern civilization. The Indian constitution, for example, is an instance of an aspirational constitution. It recognizes the rights that citizens held before the adoption of the constitution. In fact, we have held that the right to life was not something which was conferred by the constitution, but it was recognized by the constitution. So that even if the right to life is now suspended as during the course of an emergency, that does not mean that your right to access judicial remedies stands suspended. So on the birth of the constitution, as all of you are very well familiar, you have practices like untouchability or sati, the burning of a widow on the pyre of a husband. The Indian constitution sought to overhaul the existing socio-political order that was entrenched in the vices of discrimination and arbitrariness to create a new order embedded in the ideals of justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. Another example of an aspirational or what is otherwise called a transformative constitution is the South African constitution. The patterns of social, political and economic life in South Africa were influenced by appetite access to public areas, permissible relationships, political participation, among other things, was restricted based on color. Much like the Indian constitution then, when the South African constitution was adopted, it sought to shape a new socio-political order. A plethora of rights, which were not available earlier, were recognized. It includes the right to equality, the right to fair labor practices, and the right not to be subjected to slavery or forced labor. The injustices of the past, which you see in the Indian constitution, were sought to be cured by the adoption of the South African constitution. In fact, the rights framework in both the Indian and the South African constitutions is elaborate because the injustice that traced every aspect of a citizen's life were sought to be cured by the constitution. The chapter on fundamental rights is for this reason often referred to as the soul of the constitution. But the mere recognition of fundamental rights is not sufficient for their effective protection because values are just not simply self-reinforcing. So while articles 14 and 21 of our constitution recognize the right to equality and the right to life and liberty, they don't enforce themselves. On the adoption of our constitution in 1950, society did not miraculously wake up to an equal social order. On 26 January 1950, the day that the constitution was adopted, 
Indian society was stratified as it was the day before. Sati, untouchability and female infanticide still plagued society. Political dissenters were still imprisoned for, for exercising their right to free speech. But with the adoption of the constitution, the state was entrusted with a duty, the affirmative obligation to create a society premised on the principles of social, economic and political justice. The state, in other words, became an instrument for realizing the values entrenched in the constitution. By the very nature of the duty which is placed on the state for realizing constitutional values, the state loses the face of neutrality. The state is expected to act in accordance with the constitution, which has already charted out a specific plan for the attainment of social, political and economic justice. The constitution, by espousing certain values, goads the state towards their fulfillment. We might as well ask our question, ourselves the question, how does the state give effect to these constitutional values? Is it sufficient if the constitution grants rights to citizens and places a corresponding duty on the state to enforce such rights? George Orwell's fable, The Animal Farm, throws light upon the issue that I am attempting to now elucidate. In the fable, in Manor Farm, the animals rebel against their human omena. After a successful revolution overthrowing the humans, they adopt the seven commandments. One of the commandments is that all animals are equal. However, Napoleon, the pig, establishes an authoritarian regime. Napoleon demands that the hens hand over their eggs to be sold. When the hens, when the hens deny it, they are starved and later slaughtered. Similarly, though it was the idea of Snowball, another pig, to establish a windmill to ease the workload of the animals, Napoleon takes the credit for the idea, thus distorting the truth. Orwell ends the fable with a message, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Why were the seven commandments not sufficient to protect the rights of animals? The governance in Manor, in Manor Farm fell apart because there were no entrenched rules or institutions for governance. The lack of these rules led to an arbitrary exercise of power, radically altering the very content of rights themselves. My argument is that the rights regime in the constitution, similar to the seven commandments, would only be, as Justice Scalia calls it, a parchment guarantee if the constitution does not establish a structure that effectively checks the exercise of power and the abuse of power. That is why for the constitution to stand the test of time, it is necessary that alongside assigning a duty to the state to protect fundamental rights or fundamental values or freedoms, it must also establish other institutions to create a system of governance. The system of governance which is envisaged in the constitution is as important a component of constitutionalism as much as the rights framework because it places a check to ensure that the state exercises its power fairly. The expansion of the rights framework would be insignificant if the constitution describes a weak form of governance that does not ensure that the state exercises its power fairly and equitably or if the judiciary interprets constitutional silences and interpretative gaps in a manner that would weaken the system of governance. Constitutional theorists on the heels of Montesquieu opined that a strict separation of powers between different institutions of governance is the best method of assembling power. Scholars belonging to this school of thought, and there are still plenty of them today, believe that parliament is supreme and that the courts do not have the power to strike down legislation. The institution that enacts law, the institution that enforces law, and the institution that interprets the law 
are demarcated into specific functional spheres, at least in theory. But it soon came to be understood that possession of power does not necessarily mean that it would be exercised judiciously. And so another school of thought arose which propounded that checks must be placed on the exercise of power to ensure that power is not exercised in a malified manner or that it is not clothed with personal attributes. Because those who hold power are human as well. And to be human is to err. As King Henry in Shakespeare's Henry V says, I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me. The element shows to him as it doth to me. All his senses have but human conditions. His ceremonies laid by in his nakedness, he appears but a man. Thus the two components that ensure constitutionalism are first a guarantee of rights and second a system of governance that checks the exercise of power of other institutions. The system of governance in turn has two components, constitutional processes and institutions of governance which are vested with powers and duties. The existence of a guarantee of rights and a system of governance have been understood to infuse the principle of constitutionalism as early as the 17th century. In 1776, the town of Concord, Massachusetts resolved that a constitution in its proper idea intends a system of principles established to secure the subject in the possession and enjoyment of their rights against any encroachment of the governing part. Similarly, Article 16 of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen of 1789 stated that any society in which the guarantee of rights is not assured, nor the separation of powers determined, has no constitution. The Indian constitution is structured along the two ideals which I have just briefly adverted to. Part 3 of the constitution recognizes the rights of citizens and persons. But more importantly or equally significantly, the rest of the provisions of the constitution outlines the distribution of power among numerous institutions. The constitution demarcates the scope of power of the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. Each institution is intended to place a check on the exercise of power by the other institutions. The judiciary has the power to strike down legislation for a violation of fundamental rights or for the infringement of any other constitution provision. Executive actions are also amenable to judicial review. The executive is collectively responsible to the lower house, that is the house of the people. The Election Commission of India is a constitutional body entrusted with superintendence and control over elections. It is intended to prevent the interference of the ruling faction in the electoral process. Similarly, the constitution prescribes a decentralized model of governance, which is a bottom-up approach towards governance. The constitution creates municipalities, cooperative societies, and a whole host of local participatory institutions going down to the level of the villages across India. There are over 640,000 such villages. The local bodies of governance democratically, democratically decentralize power from the center to the locally elected authorities to encourage the involvement of citizens in public governance. Because the greater the involvement of citizens in governance, the greater likelihood that it would create a field of greater accountability. In this way, the constitution divides power and creates a system of accountability to minimize the misuse of power. The entrenchment of local bodies and governance under the constitution symbolizes the checks that are introduced on the exercise of power from the grassroots to the highest levels of governance. Now the division of power between different institutions and the substantive checks on the exercise of power are not the only constitutional arrangements to prevent the misuse of power. The constitution inhibits malify the exercise of power and safeguards the violation of constitutional values 
by introducing procedural guarantees. Procedural guarantees serve two purposes. First, they prevent the seepage of bias and unfairness in the process of decision making. A decision that is reached after following procedural rules is expected to be fair. Second, a fair procedure is not only a means of, attend of achieving a fair outcome, but it's also an end in itself, a goal in itself. Procedural requirements create a stumbling block on the free exercise of power. Such stumbling blocks are necessary because they suggest that power is not unrestrained and must be exercised with circumspection. Article 21 guarantees the right to life and liberty, but it introduces the facet of procedural guarantees. So does Article 22, which inculcates the principle of national justice. Recently, the Supreme Court of India, for those of you who are interested in the name, in, in the Subhash Desai case, expounded on the importance of legislative procedure in the furtherance of democratic ideals. Article 122 of the Indian Constitution states that the validity of proceedings in Parliament shall not be challenged on the ground of an alleged irregularity of procedure. The issue before us less than a month ago was related to the scope of judicial review of procedural infringements in Parliament, chiefly by the Speaker. The court recognized that legislative procedure serves two objectives. First, it enables deliberation on the floor of the House, and such deliberation produces better outcomes that are more compatible with constitutional values. Second, it creates a system to check the power exercised by the incumbent government. Writing for a five-judge bench, I held that a violation of procedure that subserves one of the objectives recognized above and which is necessary for the sustenance of democracy would render the action invalid and that the bar in Article 122 shall not apply to such cases. Thus, it is imperative that procedural requirements entrenched in the Constitution or otherwise must be understood in terms of the broader purpose that they serve of, serve, of safeguarding constitutional values and checking the abuse of exercise of power. In that case, we were called upon to decide as to whether the Speaker had correctly recognized the whip in Parliament and we held in the state legislature and we held that the Speaker in exercising his discretion to recognize a whip on the floor of the House had acted con contrary to constitutional values and therefore this was not just an irregularity of procedure but something which could be reviewed by the court. Now, constitutions also introduce stringent procedures to safeguard higher constitutional values. A gradation in the rigorousness of the procedure indicates that procedural guarantees do indeed check in checking the aid in checking the exercise of power. A more stringent procedure is prescribed to check the abuse of higher constitutional values. For example, Article 368 of our Constitution, which prescribes the procedure to amend the Constitution, stipulates that an amendment to the provisions of the Constitution shall require a two-thirds majority in both Houses of Parliament. However, an amendment to certain provisions that deal with the scope of the legislative power and the executive power of the states or the power of the judiciary requires a special majority, that is a majority of two-thirds of the members of Parliament and a ratification by the legislature of at least half of the Indian states. In other words, the constitution introduces a stringent amending procedure to safeguard the autonomy of the states, which to my mind is an important facet of federalism. Another important example of constitutional entrenchment of a stringent procedure to safeguard constitutional principles is traceable to the ordinance making power of the president. The president at the center, the union government, and the governor in the states have the power to promulgate a law on the aid and advice of the council of ministers when either of the houses of the legislature 
are not in session. The ordinance making power of the executive is a departure, is a departure from the parliamentary form of governance and representative democracy, which are chief values of our constitution. But the constitution circumscribes the exercise of the ordinance making power. The provision prescribes that the ordinance promulgated in such cases shall cease to operate on the expiry of six weeks from the reassembly of parliament. And parliament has to reassemble within six months of the conclusion of the earlier session. So the life of the ordinance cannot exceed six months and six weeks. A limit on the operation of the ordinance is prescribed to prevent the misuse of the ordinance making power, which would subvert parliamentary accountability and weaken democratic functioning. Having discussed the broad framework of the arrangement of power among various institutions in the constitution, it is important that we understand the role of courts in the constitution structure. Through judicial review, courts primarily engage in the function of scrutiny. That is to say that they are tasked with scrutinizing the actions of legislatures and the executive. We can all agree that the job of the court is to interpret the law. But how should courts interpret the law, particularly in situations where there are interpretative gaps or in cases of constitutional silences? Courts in India, and in fact all over the world, do not rely solely on a single method of constitutional interpretation. Therefore, to my mind, when you talk about the originalist view or the interpretational view, or the transformative view of the constitution, that's to beg the question. Because there is no one single theory, at least that's what I've gained as my own personal learning over the last 23 years on the bench. Constitutional courts are generally eclectic in their interpretation. If you ask a student of law to start coloring a well-reasoned judgment of a constitutional court, you will soon discover that judgment is actually a rainbow. Different colors fuse together to represent different interpretative approaches. In fact, just a week before we closed, when we were in the midst of uh, the hearing on the marriage equality case, which I'm not going to speak about because <laughs> <laughs> they reserve judgment, I, I told the, uh, the councillors appearing for the Union of India, I said, but you have to interpret the constitution in a transformative way. But he said, Chief Justice, four years ago, you accepted my submission that this was the correct original interpretation of the constitution <laughs> to which I responded but there's no one single theory that we uh, espouse as judges we look at the original text as well but we also look at the transformative potential of the constitution so this fusion of interpretative approaches helps a judge to interpret a constitution as the time changes as Justice Cardozo says a written constitution states or ought to state not rules for the passing hour, but principles for an expanding future. The text of a written constitution is often inadequate and does not and cannot deal with a multitude of situations that may arise. So words like human dignity, liberty and freedom contain within themselves a range of meanings. The text can also be ambiguous, vague, or just simply silent. Even a detailed constitution such as the Indian constitution may be found to be insufficiently explicit on particular contestations of power. The Indian courts were initially captivated by the idea that the written text or the black letter of the law was the only guide to constitutional interpretation. But gradually we move beyond the plain text. Rather than focusing on a singular textual provision, we began looking at all parts of the constitution together and their relationship with each other, the values that those parts espouse and the purpose that they serve. Courts have expansively interpreted fundamental rights by reading derived rights into the constitution. For example, the right to speedy justice, the right to environment, the right to a livelihood, the right to health, have all been read into the due process or Article 21 guarantee. The Indian courts have recognized that the right to life and liberty can be effectively protected only when an umbrella of other rights that it encompasses is recognized. 
1970, the Indian Supreme Court, in a very famous and well known judgment in Keshwanand Bharti, held that Parliament does not have unbridled power to amend the Constitution and that the basic structure, that is, the values of the Constitution that form the basis of the Constitution, cannot be abrogated by constitutional amendments. However, in spite of the decision in Keshwan and Bharti, the Indian courts have been rather reluctant to interpret provisions that deal with structural arrangements of power based on constitutional values. That is quite surprising. I assume that one of the reasons for this relative reluctance is the understanding that the constitution is primarily a document that protects the rights of citizens and thus it is only acceptable to branch beyond the text to interpret the rights regime. However, as I discussed earlier, the structural arrangements of power within the constitution are as important a component of the constitution as the rights regime. One cannot be effective simply without the other. It is thus imperative that courts interpret constitutional silences across various provisions relating to structural arrangements of power based on the values of the constitution. In simple terms, let me use the example of a rope to elucidate the importance of constitutional values. A rope is manufactured by twisted strands of hemp or nylon. Each strand joins forces with the other to give shape and form to the rope. The form of the rope would not remain the same if even one of the strands of the rope is detached. Similar to how the numerous strands of the thread form the rope, the numerous values entrenched in the provisions form the constitution. And they do not necessarily pull in the same direction, but often they are pulling in divergent directions. But that adds to the strength of the rope, which forms the fabric of the constitution. An alteration which includes an alteration through interpretation that is contrary to even one of these numerous values would render the constitution unrecognizable. It is beyond the scope of my lecture today to delve into how the courts must identify these values. I will now instead focus on how the courts have safeguarded constitutional structure and in turn constitutional rights by adopting an interpretation that furthers the values of the constitution. Before discussing a fairly recent judgment of the Supreme Court of India, where it has adopted such an approach, I think it is necessary that I touch upon the decision of the UK Supreme Court in Miller II. In Miller II, as we know, the UK Supreme Court set aside the proclamation proroguing Parliament, issued by Her Majesty the Queen, on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. The Supreme Court held that the prorogation had the effect of preventing the ability of Parliament to carry out its constitutional functions as a legislature, as, as the body responsible for the supervision of the executive. That is, the prorogation frustrated the principles of parliamentary sovereignty and executive accountability. The UK Supreme Court in Miller II used core constitutional values to test the validity of the actions of the executive. By doing so, the court did not dislodge the structural arrangement of power in the UK polity. Rather, it had re-established the principle of limited government. Let me now discuss the decision of the Supreme Court of India in comparison on the ordinance making power of the executive through the president and the governor, which is an exception to the rule that laws are enacted by the legislature, which constitutes the representatives of the people. As I said a short while ago, by entrusting the authority to promulgate ordinances on the president and the governor, the Indian constitution in that sense has made a departure from the principle of parliamentary governance. In Krishna Kumar Singh, the second case, the Supreme Court of India rejected a textual reading of the provisions, which provided that ordinances would have the same, quote-unquote, force and effect as an act of parliament. While interpreting these words, namely same force and effect, the court reasoned 
that the ordinance power was not a prerogative of the executive, but was subject to a condition precedent and a condition subsequent provided in the text. The condition precedent requires the executive head to be satisfied that such an action was necessary in the circumstances and that immediate action needs to be taken. These phrases contributed to the court's understanding that the ordinance power must be exercised only when certain narrowly circumscribed conditions exist. If these conditions are not met, the exercise of the ordinance making power would be invalid. The court restricted the ordinance making power since it is an exception to Parliament's exclusive competence to enact laws and since it dislodges the principle of representative democracy. The conditions were understood to strictly circumscribe the power of the executive to make laws in a parliamentary democracy where the executive is collectively responsible to the legislature. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the judicial process enables a scrutiny of the actions of the legislature and the executive. However, the process of scrutiny is not the domain of courts alone. The values prescribed in the Constitution are in numerous instances, are in numerous instances potentially conflicting. For example, the Indian Constitution is riddled with rights or conceptions of rights that conflict with one another. On the one hand, the right to equality of every citizen is recognized by the Constitution. What does equality mean? Does it mean really just formal equality? On the other hand, marginalized sections of society such as women and those belonging to the backward castes are granted reservations or affirmative action in education and government employment and in the legislatures. Prima facie, to some, it might appear that there's a conflict between individual rights and group rights. In fact, the issue of whether the affirmative action policy is an exception to the right to equality or is a facet of equality has plagued the Indian polity since the 1950s, which has also led us to the question as to whether affirmative action detracts from merit, which leads you to the question of what is merit essentially? And is a more inclusive society, not a society which contributes to merit, or is an exclusionary society, which goes by, say, standard test scores, a society which is truly meritocratic? Difficult question, but it is not always necessary for the courts to be the first site for resolving these potential conflicts. Every institution of governance has a responsibility towards promoting the values of the constitution and resolving the conflicts between these values in a manner that promotes the identity of the constitution. The court's ability and its enthusiasm to adjudicate these issues must not diminish the democratic space available to citizens or usurp the functions of other democratic mechanisms. While courts enforce rights on a case-by-case -case basis or in class action suits, the judicial system is not designed to be a panacea. Moreover, legal truth or the position discerned by courts on the basis of the rules of evidence must not be confused with the social truth. Although they may both overlap to a certain extent, Social truths can exist even when they cannot easily be proved in a court of law. Courts are therefore a very effective tool in the quest to realize constitutional rights, but their field of impact is often laser focused and limited in scope. Everyone here will agree with me when I say that to be equal is not only to be equal in the eyes of law, although that is no doubt an important facet of equality, but to be treated as equals by our fellow citizens. The indignity of inequality often comes not in the form of a policy or a law, but in the form of, say, exclusion from informal workplace gatherings or even social groups in school and university due to gender, caste or race. <coughs> 
One of the biggest challenges that we collectively face is how we surmount issues of this nature where there is no violation of a legally enforceable right in the traditional sense. Certainly, judicial institutions were neither meant to tackle such problems, nor are they equipped to do so. The issue with framing all social and political issues in the language of rights and resorting to the courts to resolve these issues is that it reduces the constitutional space envisaged for other democratic mechanisms. The constitution envisions other methods through which the abuse of power can be legitimately checked. This includes debates and discussions inside and outside the legislature on crucial issues. The executive can be held accountable for its actions by parliament inside the house and outside by courts and by the citizenry. The final component, which is necessary for the effective realization of rights, is the role ascribed to an individual in a constitutional democracy. The constitution in this age is a unique role for the individual, whose engagement with the other institutions I have spoken of is crucial to the realization of rights. For instance, pre-legislative consultative processes are an apt instance where an informed citizenry can place an effective check on legislative functions. Consultation even before legislation is introduced in parliament or the state legislatures or the local legislatures. I'll give you an example. There's a bill to amend the Kerala Police Act of 2011. Public comments were called on the bill. When the bill was introduced in the House, it was referred to the Select Committee and the Select Committee conducted district-wide meetings across the state. About four to five hundred people attended these meetings and the impact of such an extensive consultative process was the suggestion of 790 amendments to the draft bill after nearly four hours of extensive debate. Around 240 of those suggested amendments, most of which were centered on public feedback, were ultimately accepted. The South African Constitution recognizes pre-legislative consultation as a crucial aspect of the structural arrangements of power. A pre-legislative consultative process is entrenched in the Constitution itself, and a law that is enacted without pre-legislative consultation is unconstitutional. In 2005, Parliament of South Africa enacted a legislating legislation relating to reproductive health care. The Constitutional Court of South Africa de declared these laws to be unconstitutional because the National Council of Provinces did not fulfill its obligation of initiating public deliberation on the law. It is thus important for citizens to engage in a dialogue with each other and with the legislative and executive arms of the state. Perhaps that area of dialogue is shrinking. The practice of constitutional values and the organic reorientation of societal practices is essential to achieving the constitutional vision. Active participation by the citizenry in the democratic process in ways that are not expressly mentioned in the constitution but are nonetheless implicit in the structure, are indispensable to realizing constitutional rights. In this way, not only is the judiciary, which engages in scrutinizing the affairs of the state, essential, but so also the citizenry itself has a vital role to play. Every branch of government bears allegiance to the structures and processes delineated in the constitution. Each and every constitutional authority, be it a judge, a member of parliament, a police officer in your locality, or a civil servant, assumes control over the enforcement of constitutional law. Beyond constitutional authorities, though, it is individuals and communities who themselves play an indispensable role 
in the aim to achieve constitutional rights. It is only by valuing both constitutional structures and constitutional rights that an enduring constitution could be created. I said a lot.